Okay. So we're the early birds, huh? <laughs> the older you get, the sooner you start moving, you know? <laughs> That's right. How have you been? Uh, I'm getting uh, I'm getting that cold that uh, Marco had. I think he uh, he passed it on to me. Across the Atlantic, huh? Yeah, here virtually. I don't know how I got it, but it it could be also because you know the grandson brings home everything possible from kindergarten as well. So <laughs> that's true. Yeah, the little children are very contagious. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So whatever whatever they got, we get and. It makes the round through the house, and once it's gone, the next next batch comes in. And it's just part of the deal. Well, I've been taking cold showers. Oh, yeah? I've been following this guy, Wim Hof. I think he's yeah. from the Netherlands. Have you heard of him? The, the name sounds familiar. He's very eccentric. Yeah, Wim, Wim, Wim is a very Dutch name. Well, the Dutch are very eccentric. Yeah, well, they're studying him. Harvard Medical School is studying him. He... um. He can immerse himself in ice cold water. Is he the guy that also does the needle thing? Needle? I don't think he does needle. Oh no, that was Jack Schwartz. I think. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, that, yeah. he was also a Dutch guy. Yeah. He was a Dutch guy. I, I remember reading up on him many years yeah. ago, and yeah. he used to lie down on a on a right. bed of, of nails. Nails, yeah. And, and he would be stab marks in his back, and he would heal them. In front yes, of the office. Yes, yes. Or you could take knitting needles and stick them through his arm and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty Wim, bizarre. Wim Hof is, um, he uses cold water, ice mm. cold water. And he can immerse himself in ice water uh -huh. for an hour and a half. Yeah. He breaks all records. He, he, most people can't survive five minutes in ice cold water. Right, right. right yeah. We don't go into cardiac arrest. But uh, they've been studying him. Mm -hmm. and he also does breath, intense yeah. breath work. And I've been following the breath work, and I've been taking 10-minute cold showers a day for the last mm -hmm. six months. Yeah, you're a better man than I am, John. <laughs> well, you know, I think this ice, they call him the ice man, and I, I yeah. think they did this some, they did the study where they, um, he and his, some of his students yeah. all took, I think it was E. coli, mm -hmm. some bacteria that, that makes people violently yeah. ill. Uh, and of the 20 people, including himself, no one got no, sick. Yeah. No one. <laughs> yeah. And this has got Harvard Medical School very, very curious because, it, of course, if, they, if it isn't something drug related, that they can't make a profit. Yeah, they, can't, they, can't, they can't deal with it, you know. Yeah. Breath and cold water. <laughs> That's yeah. all you need. Well, that whole idea about hot and cold and, and switching them off, uh, my, when my wife feels a cold coming on, she takes. She alternates. She put, turns on the water really hot in the shower, and then she turns it ice cold. And she does that kind of back and forth, which is the, the same basic principle that the Finns use with their saunas. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I, I, went to, uh, I went to Finland yeah. once. And we you were, went to Hi, Finland? Doug, how you doing? Hello. And, uh, and we, went, we went to the sauna. It was in the middle of October. So we all – who's that? It's not me. It's my buzzer. I'm ignoring it. Oh, okay. But anyhow, uh, we went into the sauna and, and and then we went out and jumped in the lake and the lake was eight degrees. Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about cardiac arrest, <laughs> you, you have this really big, <laughs> or you wonder where the air's coming from, but it's, it's surprisingly invigorating and it's, and that's, that's kind of like the classical case where you'd say, okay, well, you're going to come down with a cold or some kind of infection. Nothing. Yeah. It was it was really a, a very enlightening experience, you know. So there there is something to it all. I can oh, there's you. definitely something to it. It feels great. I wouldn't yeah. do it if I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. Cuz I can take a 10 minute uh, ice cold shower and it doesn't bother me at all. And then I go out into the ice in you know, a cold weather and it, it it feels mild. Yes. You know? Yeah. So yeah. I think there's some um benefits to it. Uh I'll let you know if I this, make it through the winter without a cold i'll be thrilled <laughs> yeah, i'd be happy to know not that i'm going to follow in your footsteps but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, oh look our fearful leaders here is doing well then. <laughs> how is everybody you're fearful and trembling yeah well i'll tell you 
when, when you do that much voiding, as you've been doing, like, you know, like, uh, <laughs> you're a brave man. <laughs> Oh, there, there's, there's multiple dimensions to a donut. Yeah, there certainly is. <laughs> Including the empty center. Yeah. How are you all? Well, I got your, I got your cold, but uh, <laughs> other than that, just fine. Is that how the cold shower talk started? That's how the cold showers started. <laughs> yes, it did. Cold well, showers are much colder in the winter, by the way. Well, well, they are. Yeah. I was interested in that topic because I feel like I'm hypersensitive to the cold. I'm too sensitive to the cold. And as soon as winter starts approaching, I begin fantasizing about moving to Costa Rica or getting some kind of a winter cottage in on the beach somewhere where it's tropical and warm and sunny and delicious. Uh, I don't like the cold weather, but I like that, uh, that approach of ex like exposing yourself to the cold water, like yeah. yourself. like that. Um, there's a, I don't know his name. He's maybe an Eastern European person. Wim Hof. Is, Is it, it Wim Hof? Yeah. Maybe. He, you posted a YouTube video of his. Yeah, we were talking about him. Yeah. Ah, okay. Maybe I should try it. He's yeah, one of those good. crazy Dutch guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could do the, I'd do the breath work maybe half an hour every, every day. I've gone up to an hour. But if I, can do the, if I do the breath work, I have gone up to 105 push-ups. Wow. I can't do, I can barely do 50 without any breath work. So there's something to this. <laughs> I, mean, I guess I, so, John. I can barely think about fifty. <laughs> I, I, I don't do I don't do 105 every time, but I can always get up to 80, and sometimes I go over 100. So uh, it's like amazing to me. That's that to me is definite proof. There's something to this because that that to me. That's prior to all this, at once. I, yeah, I I can't, and wow. uh, it's really freaky. And it's, but yeah, I have to do that. You'd have to do a half hour of, of a very intense breath work. Yeah, well, I can imagine. Before that will kick in. But, but I think athletes are doing this, and a lot of people who are interested in, you know, this going to the next level, becoming superhuman, um, they're trying this stuff. And mm -hmm. if it boosts the immune system, you know, I think we should use every technique we can. No, I'm all for it. I think it's great. I think I think we should try whatever we can and whatever we feel capable of doing. I just love it when a guy goes out there and breaks all records. Like this is something that is humanly impossible, um, and he's proven that he can do it. He can. Yeah, I like that. Immerse in ice water for an hour and a half, and he's fine. Mm -hmm. And this this freaks out the experts, you know, mm -hmm. because one of the laws. Their physiological laws that they're very has been has been Ooh. proven invalid. <laughs> so, so I love that. He made me think about uh, Houdini and mm. these other characters who uh, get themselves out of seemingly impossible binds. Mm -hmm. I feel that that's that's a theme that we've played with a little bit and, uh, <laughs> with these tangled donatologies and these voids at the center of hyperspheres and whatnot, it can feel sometimes that we get ourselves or I can, I feel like I get myself into binds uh, around in those spaces. And so that is, uh, well, <laughs> that one of the uses perhaps of a conversation like this is to unbind or to dissolve. Uh, and to play with that cycle of form and formlessness uh, mm -hmm. that you write about, John, in your essay, Alternate Ways of Knowing, mm -hmm. which I did indeed float with. Mm -hmm. You did what? Uh, yes, float with mm -hmm. yesterday evening. In your flotation uh, tank. I did. Uh, I took a bus to Boulder, and on the bus ride, I reread the essay, and I looked at the pictures that everybody drew and then I you know, did my float session and stuff happened and stuff didn't happen <laughs> and and came home so uh it was it was it was interesting it was well 
I'll, I, I, it, it was interesting to go into that kind of space and find what's really there to be encountered. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly, it was just my body floating in water <laughs> that was there. <laughs> so no, no, uh, no supernatural uh, types of phenomena. Um, but I was very interested in that story because of the way that you approached the experience, uh, particularly ex uh, looking at the experience for what it means. Looking, for, looking at the real life experience, you said, as a metaphor. And I thought that was an interesting way of shifting the perspective because the question then is not whether something is real or not. You, we're putting that question to the side or just letting it go. The question, the, the, the experience itself is presumed to be real as an experience. And but more than that, because it means something. The experience is glorious, but it also means something. And so I'm curious what these experiences and also the non-experiences, like my just going into a float tank and being who I am there, mean <laughs> to us all. I'll be honest with you. Um, to me, and this is why I don't think I really have an ontology, or maybe I have a very bad ontology. Everything is real. I don't make a big distinction like everybody else seems to. All of this is real. And synchronicities are sometimes extraordinary experiences, but they're, they're also very ordinary. I believe speaking a sentence is a synchronistic event. Hearing a sentence and understanding it is synchronistic. So I would be very interested in finding a process that we can do today there, there are three of us I could do a little modeling around intuition and I believe that would be very experiential it would take about 20 minutes maybe half an hour like we did last time and have some maps and then I think this uh, essay I don't know if anyone's read it besides Marco but well, I, I think you had okay oh, yeah. we, could re we could reflect on it if you have read it if you haven't it doesn't matter because I, I want to update it uh, with some other uh, sources that I could share with you guys. And mm -hmm. uh, you would be providing me with a, a great opportunity to uh, reopen this investigation. Um, because I think it, it's more important to me that people have some real experiences that they can point to in a dynamic way and create maps as we did with time. And then I, I think there's something that emerges that would not have emerged if we hadn't taken that, made that effort to contact, uh, make a deeper contact, and then to, from words, language, body, to metaphor, to uh, something that you could draw, an object that you could draw, and then you can share it because you, then you've taken an internal process, an internal state, and you've externalized them. And I believe that's uh, where our coherence, if, if, we, if we get to a more coherent system, it'll be because of those kinds of adventures. Um, and that's what motivates me. So does that sound good to you guys? Are you guys open to this possibility, this adjacent possibility? Um, I'm okay. always using it. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Yeah, this will be part of my... Um, phenomenological investigation and hopefully another perhaps another paper will come out of it or another essay or just a very good time maybe some learning event will occur for all of us here i hope uh, um but for, before we get started on that could i ask you guys about the maps of time that we did we did that two weeks ago and we've mm -hmm. had s lots of conversations online and i posted them all and i was wondering if you guys could give us any feedback about what you might have learned about your own map or the maps of others or uh, about time. Would anyone like to uh, discuss that or explore anything you may have learned? 
Well, one of the things I learned, John, is that I'm still the most artistically challenged of anybody that's been in any of these groups. But at the same time, I, I found I found especially the the back and forth between uh, TJ and you, mm-hmm. where you kind of took that you know that image that you had and took that a step further. I, I found that very very interesting because I really liked purely subjectively that image of that that kind of hooded figure with a circle in the middle and the line down there. Why I don't know, but I was particularly drawn to that. And and what you were able to do then was provide let's say a, a larger context for understanding what that what that might mean. And it's it's very it was it's very different from the the map that I drew and the one that I kind of have in my mind because there was a lot of movement in them. Whereas, you know, mine had a lot of places on them and I, I, I pop up every once in a while, but there's no, there's no strong connection between point A and point B or point A and point G or whatever it was. That, um, even the more that I think about it, um, it all tends to be relatively episodic, whereas in a given episode, I do feel relations to things before, after, ahead, whatever. But it's not like that I ever feel myself moving from one to the other. You know, that movement is kind of kind of missing. And that was one thing that did did attract me very much to uh to both your depictions that you had and then the discussion that, you know, surrounded that as well. Yeah, I, I kind of feel that that tapestry I, I was talking about that kind of surrounds my head is similar to to Ed's model in a lot of ways where if there's no if, if an idea pops up or i'm having a conversation or whatnot um there's no set point it's it's out in space or similar like just like in in a lot of ways and it'll kind of be out there branch out um yeah and that's about all i have to say about that i, I had one comment about I, I don't know who posted the video um for this, the reading before um, and the watching before this, um, but it was the uh, the lady who did the the modeling. Um, Is it on time in the body? Yes, yes, the time yeah, in the body. That but last night. There that was, was one. Merlin, Merlin Donald is in that. Yeah. Okay, uh, but there's one point. One of the commenters at the end, the lady, I think, around the twenty. 20 minute mark was talking about the Hindu goddess um, having multiple arms, but that reminded me of Marco's description. Kind of, he had the, the flowing above in the middle, like cascading in the future. But, and she, she mentioned that's, that's the kind of outside space and time, the timelessness part. Of it. So maybe that's where your, your void is coming from. <laughs> I didn't get to see the video. I just noticed it before our call now started. It looks really interesting. It's a short video, but it's it's about um, um, the perceptual system in time. Yeah. I think it's very similar to the, the kind of process that we went through. I I I'm cur- I'm, I'm interested in watching it because part of I think the um, uh, uh, I don't know how exactly how to put this, but part of the kind of void aspect, let's say, of our various models is the location of the self and the the, that seat or that center of consciousness like where is that in all all of these places is it is it a point is it a body is it space is it multi-dimensional outside of all of that where where do the where does where does that um uh whatever that word points to right uh, where, where does that appear or show up? And of course that, uh, well, not of course, I mean, uh, part of what I think I've, I've been exploring without na- naming it necessarily, but I drew it, is how that relates to the body. Uh, m- my drawing has a body in it, and uh, I'm feeling time and space as flows through, the, through my body. But it's my particular body. 
And so it can't, by definition, include all the other bodies and all the other modes of awareness or intelligence. So uh, I'm curious about where those limits are to our respective models and how um, those reflect on the way that we experience, uh, experience or perceive that the self, uh, and whatever way that that is, you know, caught in a dimension, a dimensionality. I don't even know how to talk about this. It's mm. so weird. That's great. It didn't, it didn't sound weird, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can explain. That sounded very sane. <laughs> I think you're, 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 you're hypernormalizing. Uh, the <laughs> Huh? Well, I think this is, uh, I, 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 no, I showed you that dream, that image I received from a, a dream space, from a, a dream mentor. And I put it on a piece of paper, a larger piece of paper, and I said, this is the edge of my map, and I added things onto it. Um, and that's the one I posted, is all the add-ons that came on after that. Um, but I think going to the edge of your map is a really good place to be. And I think uh, Gregory Bateson made the comment that uh, children know that they don't know. And so they're free to experiment. But I think as uh, adults, we know a lot. And there's a lot of competition among the beliefs that we have and the ways we um, come to know things. And so it's um, having to drop all of that is a, is a very big challenge so that once we go to the edge of our maps, we can be, be creative or we can just say, hell no, I'm not going there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think this is, um, uh, I've been forced into certain episodes uh, that had, I had to respond in ways that, you know, I could, which, which were quite unpredictable. Um, but I was doing, a, I'll just share another personal experience besides the one that, that's in this essay, and then maybe we can speculate a little further. But I had a, an experience when I was doing body work. I was touching people a lot, and I was sharing energy. I was, energy was passing through me, through them, back to me. We were in a circuit. And I remember um, teaching a class, and I may have told this anecdote before, uh, but there was a, a a woman who went to another part of the house, and we we were doing um, second degree Reiki. So I was we were using the symbols to send energy to her. And I remember I entered into and I imagined entering into her physical body. And when I did, I got a very strong, painful experience. It was a, uh, I started to cough something in my throat. It was painful, lacerating pain. I. The cop subsided, and when she rejoined the group, I told her that this is the response that I'd had when I, when I, when I tried to send energy to her. And she pulled on her turtleneck sweater, it was wintertime, and she had a big goiter in the center of her throat. And uh, I was really startled by that, because that was just, it was so direct, a direct hit, right? And Another experience I had, a man came to me and he had a lump on his chest and he was very upset. It was about the size of an egg. And uh, he thought he might have cancer or something. And I put my <laughs> hand on it and I touched it. And I said, I don't think it's a tumor. Um, I think it's a sprain in the intercostal muscle. And, but go see a doctor. He went to a doctor. The doctor was freaked out. The doctor took x-rays. The doctor reported back to him that it was a sprain in the intercostal muscle. And when, when this client came back to me and reported that to me, he said, how did you know that? And I said, oh, I don't know. No. And, uh, but when he left, I had to look it up in a dictionary because I didn't know what an intercostal muscle was. So I'm just offering these two examples as how touch, I think, is primary. I believe it's the primary it sets everything else in motion. And I, I hear what you're saying, Marco, previously about the self and the different models of the self. Uh, I just want to add something to this because the day I had that episode with the, where I had that telepathic communication with the bird, I was reading this book mm -hmm. 
belonging to the universe. It's Fitchtop Capra and David Stindl Rast. Hmm. And um, one of the things I was reading, they were talking about language. And um, Fitzjaf is quoting uh, Maturana, uh, the Chilean biologist. And language arises when you have communication about communication. Here's an example. When I get up in the morning and my cat comes to the kitchen and meows, and I go to the refrigerator and give her some milk, that's communication. It's a coordination of behavior. If some morning I don't have milk, and if the cat were able to say, hey, what's the matter? I've meowed three times. Where's the milk? That would be language. It would be communication about communication. The cat is not able to do that. So I, I, I find myself really fascinated by these, uh, this episode, particularly about the bird, because I, I posed a question, interior question generated inside my head about St. Francis of Assisi and what it would be like to communicate to the animals. And then following that, the bird came, it did its routine, walked up my back. I was, my shirt was off, it was summertime. Perched on this shoulder, I looked at it, it looked at me. It went to my head, it started to sing. I could feel these tones moving through my body. And then it pooped on my head and flew away. And I had a little pebble of bird shit, very solid bird shit in my, and I looked around and said, did anyone see that? Nobody of course did, but it's become a real perplexity to me um, because it seems to break all the laws that I know about, <laughs> you know, about what reality is. And that's why I've just sort of put, it doesn't mean I can't, um, operate in a consensus reality because I do, but I just don't, I, I don't give a lot of credence to it. Mm. I think there's much more going on. And then uh, there's more things in the heaven and earth ratio than I dreamt of in your philosophy. <clears throat> but I had more, I've had more experiences since then that were anomalies that I would consider just as weird as that one. Mm. And so it be, has become uh, necessary for me um, to really do some uh, investigating this. And now I believe that they were starting, this is, this is like 1990 when this experience happened. So I think we're, we're now starting to look at transcendental mind as being, uh, and we're looking at paranormal psychology and, and metanormal. And we're, we're starting to look at these, uh, investigate this stuff uh, more seriously than before. Um, so I think that more people like myself who are coming out and have had these experiences and are trying to articulate these experiences, have to go through this, uh, this mental deficient fog. It's very thick and it's, and it's on everything. Everything you touch has this thick mental deficient pollution on it. <clears throat> and, but I would like to just, you know, uh, in, the, in the effort to normalize rather than super normalize, I just want to quote something from Helen Keller from her uh, My Life. I remember the morning that I first, uh, this is about concept and percept and the interplay, which I think is very relevant to what we were doing with the maps of time. And I just wanted to invite you to listen to her, her embodied language here. I remember the morning that I first asked the meaning of the word love. This was before I knew many words. I had found a few violets in the garden and brought them to my teacher. Miss Sullivan put her arm gently around me and spelled it into my hand. I love Helen. What is love, I asked. It is here, she said, pointing to my heart, whose beats I was conscious of for the first time. Her words puzzled me very much because I did not understand anything unless I touched it. I smelt the violets in her hand, and I asked, half in words, half in signs, a question which meant, is love the sweetness of flowers? No, said my teacher. Again, I thought, the sun was warming us. Is this not love, I asked, pointing in the direction from which the heat came. Is this not love? But Miss Sullivan shook her head, and I was puzzled and disappointed. I thought it strange that my teacher could not show me love. 
A day afterward, I was stringing beads of different sizes in symmetrical groups, two large beads, three small ones, and so on. I noticed a very obvious error in the sequence, and for an instant, I concentrated my attention on the lesson and tried to think how I should have arranged the beads differently. Miss Sullivan touched my forehead and spelled with emphasis, think. And in a flash, I knew that the word was the name of the process that was going on in my head. This was my first conscious perception of an abstract idea. So I hope you guys are all with me. Mm -hmm. One more suggestion here from another blind person. Um, of course, Helen was blind and deaf. Jacques Lusseron was blind. He lost his sight when he was eight years old. And when he was 19, he was a leader in the French resistance. And uh, his job was to, he would interview people who wanted to become members of the resistance and he would detect in the tone of their voice whether they were uh, legitimate or not. And the one time he, he accepted someone into the, into the membership because he was a lot of pressure, even though he didn't trust them, that was the one who, who uh, sold them out. And he ended up in Buchenwald. And so he, he writes a, a very beautiful memoir about his experiences in Buchenwald and he survived it. And I just wanted to quote this one section because I think studying people with, um, who are blind or who, uh, who are autistic or who have disabilities, or I've worked a lot with dementia, there are other way, there's alternate ways of knowing. And I think what he says, I think is a very, very interesting. He says, one of the greatest riches at our disposal is that there exists so many possibilities of sensual perception. <clears throat> there is no unique or irreplaceable sense. Each sense can take the place of another if it is used in its totality. This sounds like synesthesia to me. Seeing, he says, is a superficial sense. It is a tool. And he says, we, we people who are sighted miss out on a lot. <laughs> he says, all of our senses, I believe, join into one. They are the successive stages of a single perception, and that perception is always one of touch. Therefore, hearing can replace seeing, and seeing can replace touch. At this point, I ask myself whether what we call attention could be the psychological form of this fundamental contact, of a form based on feeling as well as intellect. In other words, could attention be a kind of touch? I think he's on something, onto something. I think we can use our minds. We can use our attention to experience non-kinesthetic touch, just as I did when I was able to pick up on this woman's symptom, even though she was in another room. You can pick up on symptoms from people who are on, on the other side of the planet, and you can pick up on a lot more things than just their symptoms. So I think having a model of the self is, uh, that can take in all of these, uh, this kind of phenomena will require for us, I believe, to resist the, the, the it's enculturation, you know, where there's a subject object divide, the, the subject is here, the object is there. And there's, a, and there's a separation. I think this is brought about by our visual system, but we have other, other sensory systems, which uh, I think Gebser was very attuned to. And I believe that we're now in this mental deficient phase where we're dominated by the visual and it's, epidemic and i think that there's widespread dissociation and i'm i'm hope i'm i'm quoting one more poet here uh, coleridge who in his ode to dejection he he describes a beautiful landscape and the end of the stanza he says i see but do not feel how beautiful you are that to me is very clear that he's expressing this deep alienation between the visual and the kinesthetic. And this split between the visual and the kinesthetic is the structure of a phobia. That's why we, we were all talking about incommensurability and different scales. Those are all products, I think, of a disconnect between the visual system and the kinesthetic system. This is my theory, and this is where I would go if I were to, to rewrite this paper. Um, so, that's a lot I put on the table. Mm -hmm. I, I hope it is, uh, will stimulate some sort of uh, uh, 
search from all of us. Um, but I would also like to ground this in um, a, a, a clean language process working with intuition. I think it'll take about five or 10 minutes each person, then that'll be the half an hour. Doug, do you have to leave early? Can you, okay. And then I think uh, you do have to leave early? Um, maybe around 4.45, but I think but you we guys- could, we, could go, we could go first with you if you like. Would that be okay? I'm ready. Okay. Does that sound like a plan? Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. Or does anyone have anything to ask me or anything want to add? Um, because I do want to have plenty of time for us to- to absorb this and to digest it, or if there are any um, any binds or double binds, maybe we're aware of. Uh, just just one comment, uh, John. Sure. Um, I come from a background where um, thought is primary, not touch. I understand this. Um, it's called virtual hapticity, being able to reach out and encounter another person without actually physically making contact. Because, yes. and, and this is one of the issues, problems, personal, whatever it is, with this whole sense of embodiment. It's the idea that, that things only happen in my body or with my body or through my body. Mm -hmm. and 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 i don't i don't believe that that doesn't that doesn't make sense to me because i do believe you touched that woman you were able to experience something coterminous with her um but there was no physical contact and physicality is and with with all due respect to helen keller and blind people is the last resort um a lot of that goes on and and especially that the, the quote that you brought between her and her teacher um when, when viewed from the outside they're obviously engaged and entwined and entangled with one another much sooner than any haptic um action or reaction that may take place and it's because of that 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 pre-interaction that pre-touching on on a non-physical <laughs> level, if you will, that enables the physical contact to make sense. And then it does make sense. Um, so, so, to, so for me, the, the, the primary side of this is, we'll call it the consciousness side or the thought side or whatever, whatever it is that I'm doing mentally. And, and, and when we're really, really lucky we get to concretize that in a physical action as well. That, that, that's how I'm, I'm kind of going at this because, you know, what you said makes a whole lot of sense, but um, the embodiment part of it, you know, I happen to be in this physical vehicle at the moment, but so what, you know, it, it, it's just the one I happen to be in. I, I, I would really like to respond to that. Um, yeah. But we could do that later. But I do think the whole notion of what's inside and what's outside breaks down mm -hmm. these experiences. Yeah. And um, you may have to put that into language, which is communication about communication. And you can't, there's no such thing as a private language. I mean, it, so we have to sort of adapt our experience to this pre-given format. And so I think that's the challenge and why we're constantly having to update our epistemologies. So we often have talked about here about visionary experiences and mm -hmm. new language and a new vocabulary. And I take that stuff very seriously. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the word haptic mm -hmm. and I was talking about non kinesthetic touch. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't experience what I experienced was when I picked up her symptom, it was coming through my body. Mm -hmm. I was using my imagination to step into her, I, mm -hmm. it was going from my first person. I stepped into her, what I imagined was her, mm -hmm. an imagined body. And I picked up information. It came through my own physical body, through my neck, through my throat. I felt it. I responded to it. 
and then asked her afterwards and then found out that she had a, a physical complaint. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a, an example of, well, what's real? It's certainly not the subject object grid that we've inherited from Descartes. Something else is going on. Now I can ignore my experience and her experience and all the other witnesses who were there, or I can start saying this model isn't working and we have to update the model. Now, that's where my uh, invitation to all of us, because I think, uh, you know, when we're talking about panentheism and um, panpsychism and talking about Bell's theorem, you know, or the topo dimensional uh, Mobius strip and uh, Klein bottle and Taurus, these are these are, to me are just are analogs. So, um, so I, I think they can help us to create more vibrant maps. I don't know that, but we're map makers. So that's what we're doing here. We're modeling, we're making maps. And I believe our maps becomes externalized. There's a, a tremendous acceleration that can occur. But if we just keep this stuff to ourselves and don't bother to externalize or create a map that we then can share, it doesn't enter into that intersubjective space where I think, you know, where we really can ground and create initiatives and take actions. So anyway, that's my big spiel. But thank you very much, Ed, for, for in, enlarging my map. <laughs> um, Kim, can I have we a start? Thought. I actually would like to have, to have a thought there um, because I think there's a connection point here between what you're describing, John, as touch uh, occurring transphysically and what Ed is talking about with respect to, um, I might call it shorthand, the primacy of thought, primacy of consciousness. Uh, and, and the connection could be in Arthur Young's uh, little vignette, like anecdote he told about the amoeba and the, the, the way that it sends out pods, pseudopods, and how thought is a kind of pseudopod and how our, in addition to our bodies becoming, you know, very complex pseudopods that are able to physically touch things, we're able to touch things through our media, through our intuition, through our dream, through our <coughs> yoga, et cetera, et cetera. There are many, many ways of, of touching. And I, I wonder if there's l less than a, a dichotomy between the mind and body or between what's non-physical and physical, it's more like a spectrum uh, of relative physicality or relative concretion uh, so that at the purest, if you will, um, l level, this is a place where language is not that, or at least my language right now is not that, that great, there is some kind of void. There is some real just nothingness. There's no... Um, nothing you can touch there. How, no how do you know that? <laughs> well, it, I think because it resists, there's some sense that it, it doesn't allow you to, um, to, to locate it. It, it doesn't, it doesn't let you, uh, when you try it, it slips away. It, it has this quality of being illimitable, of being ungraspable, uncategorizable, Etc. And so that is a kind of encounter. That is a kind of phenomena that you, we could look at in and of itself. However, the sign for the phenomena or the way that we would signify it doesn't uh, itself um, just like it doesn't itself suffice to bring the object <laughs> into focus uh, because it slips away. It's the Tao that cannot be told. Um, so from there, we, if we imagine the relative gradations of manifestation, then I think we could, you know, I, I'm not making this up right now. I mean, this is in Aurobindo, it's in Wilbur, it's this spectrum sort of theory of consciousness uh, that has a, a direct connection to, I mean, in these swirling ways, look, I'm using my hands, um, uh, that 
uh, is a continuity between between the two. And so there is a kind of touch, but it's it's also can be a very ethereal form of it. That's my theory <laughs> at this point. My ethereal well, theory. I'm reading this now. The phenomenology of embodied subjectivity. I'm also reading a book called Irrational Intuition. So I don't think we're in the realm of the irrational when we're in the when we're exploring intuition. Um, and I, so my interest is in asking a few clean questions. I thought what you were just offering, Marco, is fascinating. I would like to get clean with it, though. I'd like to use clean questions. And then we could create a map, a model. Um, and then we could each have a map and we could then start to enter into what could emerge. Mm -hmm. And then how do we find a common language? And I believe we'll be, we'll be using much more of our neurology than if we're just staying in, in concept land, especially mm -hmm. concept land created by people who lived thousands of years ago, who spoke languages we don't know, <laughs> don't understand even today what they were talking about. So I think it's a big challenge, especially when, um, and I'm very much into Aurobindo. Uh, his, his idea is that these, the, the next stage of our development won't be going into trance states and having exotic experiences. It'll be about being wide awake and we can have access to all kinds of knowledge um, but it'll be it'll be an awakening state, and I'm all for that. And I believe that the, that we are on a continuum, and that um, matter and psyche and uh, the extra physical, uh, there are all kinds of overlaps. Which is why that interesting experience with the bird was so profound for me, because I started to realize that the bird I became a bird man very briefly. But it was an unforgettable experience. <laughs> Nothing quite like it. <laughs> and I believe that it was it was downloading information. It was an initiation to the bird kingdom. I learned a lot that I that I had no I had no idea. But we know we know birds migrate thousands of miles. We know the ego the uh, the sargasso eel, which is an inch long originates in the Sargasso Sea in the middle of the Atlantic. And some of the eels go to a lake in Switzerland. Some of the eels go to the Great Lakes in the US and then they return back to the Sargasso Sea and then they die. They do this every year. <coughs> this is like, so I'm just saying, I think there's much more going on uh, with the animals and they obviously know how to communicate. And we know whales and dolphins have something probably equivalent brains to ours, and they have some kind of communication system that we, we've not been able to, to break the code yet. So I'm just putting that out there. These are, uh, uh, I, I think we just need to keep ourselves open and curious rather than commit premature cognitive commitment. I, I would borrow that from Deepak Chopra. If we make up our minds about what it is, we'll eliminate everything else. It doesn't fit. Anyway, that's my two cents. I hope we, we're open and curious and we can do this in about 20 minutes, half an hour maybe, and then we could unpack it. Mm -hmm. And then maybe we'll have alternate ways of knowing. Maybe we'll, we'll discover some new ways of, of figuring out that what that is and putting it into words would be great. This is an experiment, guys. So I haven't done this before. Let's go, let's go for it. Okay, let's go for it. Okay. Uh, and, and Doug, why don't we go first with you? Okay. All right. You ready? And when you have an intuition, how do you know intuition? Whereabouts? Intuition. It's definitely not with sight. Um, intuition. It's definitely a feeling, but not a sense. Not one of those five what? sense type of feelings. And when not a five sense type of feeling, 
there anything else about that feeling? <clears throat> it's a, a knowing, a, a sense of like gathered information. It could be a lifetime accumulation of information and honing in on a specific moment or a point, possibly. I'm imagining the point either within me or it can be without me. Uh, within you or without you? Yes. And when within you, whereabouts within you? You made a, you made a gesture. Yeah, with, within the headspace, not, not like a, a chakra or anything like that. It would be... Um, and in the, the, head, the headspace. And whereabouts in the headspace in knowing intuition? I suppose it is a specific point. Um, it's, it's within this, if you can cut me open here, it's within this line here, going back. So it's mm -hmm. above and around the head. And is there a, and when the top of the head and around, is there a size or a shape? It's almost like a, a very small seed. Oh. Um, a small seed. And how small is that seed? If, if I was to use my, my vision, I, I would have to say, well, a seed is visual, but um, this seed can be a point which could be potentially non-existent point, mathematical point, I suppose. But um, no, there's no specific size or shape. There's no specific size or shape. And, and is there anything else you know when you know an intuition? I know that I know. It's, it's a big K <coughs> knowing. I, I know, I know. A, uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Vacay? It's it's a big knowing and not maybe not necessarily an ultimate knowing godlike, but it's a just it's there. It's known and it's been known for quite a long time. Um, a vague knowing and a very long time. And when a vague knowing and known a very long time, where does that vague knowing come from? I just imagine at this point that it's kind of a, I don't know where this word's coming but from, but a swooping. <laughs> just like swoop. Swoop. <laughs> swoop. Yeah. It goes swoop. Yes. It can come from anywhere, but it's a, just a honing in to that, that spot. And swoop and honing in on that spot. And then what happens? If I'm alone, it will be the knowing, so a deeper sense of knowing. If I'm with another, I might express that with them. Um, and alone, a deeper sense of knowing. And with another... A, a sharing of the... A sharing. The, if, if I have it, that relationship. We could go on for a long time, but is, that, is this a good time for us to pause? Or is there anything else you'd like to share? That's uh, coming? Maybe two or three quick examples that I, uh, came sure. to mind while doing this. But uh, sure. it was a friend of a friend. Uh, her her uh, father had just recently passed. And I guess with my hypersensitivity, uh, I asked her if she wanted to play cribbage. And she started crying. Um, because that was her favorite game with uh, her father. And when I reflected upon it, um, it she, she was looking at the shelf where the cribbage game was. And so it can, go, it can go into the rational thought, well, I saw her look at this game and she was talking about her father maybe or whatever, but there was just that sense of 
she really needs this at this point in time, but it was only a specific glance, um, but it could have been a knowing. Um, and, and the hypersensitivity. And when a hypersensitivity, how old is that hypersensitivity? That specifically, I can only imagine it as my own personal hypersensitivity. Um, that makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah. But, is, yeah. That's the only example I can think of. Um, okay. Is there anything else that you'd like to share? Or, or I could ask you now if you could make a map of intuition that makes sense to you. I can do that. Okay. While you're doing that, I'll I'll go to Mr. Ed. Yeah, sure. And when an intuition, how do you know intuition? Whereabouts intuition? It varies. Sometimes, it varies. I, yeah, it varies. Sometimes I see it, sometimes I hear it, sometimes I feel it. And when see it, hear it, mm -hmm. sometimes feel it, what kind of it is that it? Does it have a size or a shape? No, it's about, it's about, um, the situation, it's about a situation or a circumstance, an encounter where I am, and there is, I'll, I'll pick up uh, from Doug here, a, a kind of knowing with a capital K. A There's kind the, of knowing. Yeah. With a capital K. Oh, right. And when a kind of knowing with a capital K, whereabouts is that knowing? So on the inside, the outside. I'm going to say the inside because I have the feeling that the seeing and the feeling and the hearing are on the outside. You're going to say on the inside. I'm going to say on the inside. And the seeing and the hearing and the feeling are on the outside? Yeah. And when on the inside, whereabouts on the inside? When kind of knowing with a capital K? Uh, the seeing and the hearing tends to be in the head and the feeling tends to be in the heart. Ah, seeing, feeling in the head, no, seeing, hearing, hearing head, no, feeling, and the feeling in the heart. Mm -hmm. And when feeling in the heart, whereabouts in the heart when feeling? All of it, just the heart. Just the heart? Just the heart. All yeah, all of it. Yeah. There's no place in the heart. It's not like in the upper left ventricle or something like that. It's, it's just, and when feeling in the heart and knowing with a capital K, mm -hmm. does that feeling in the heart have a size or a shape? No. 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 No, no size yeah. or shape. No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> No yeah. size or shape. No and size. is there anything else about that knowing, that feeling in the heart? And no size or shape. It's nice. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, huh, <laughs> I finally got something. <laughs> 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 And when ah, I finally got something. Yeah. What kind of I is that I when ah, I finally got something? 
Yeah, the one that didn't know before but knows now. <laughs> <laughs> and when knows now, mm. what happens to seeing, hearing in the head? You're thankful. They're thankful. They're thankful. No. No. It's a very it's a very rewarding kind of feeling. A very rewarding, rewarding. kind of feeling. Yeah, yeah. And the the hearing and the seeing the or the or the feeling yeah. are thankful mm -hmm. and very nice in the heart. Mm-hmm. And then what happens? I smile a lot. You smile a lot. I smile, yeah, I smile a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Is this a good time to pause? No, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll, I'll need a little bit of time to figure out how I put this into a picture that no one will understand. <laughs> Come at it's a, remember, it's a map of intuition that yeah, makes it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll work on something. What? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, guys. And now, can, can we go with you, Marco? Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you have an intuition, how do you know intuition? It is, I would say, a elegant combination. An mm -hmm. elegant combination. combination. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else about an elegant combination? That it also feels good feels good <laughs> it feels good through the body it uh it synchronizes the sh the chakras uh there's free flow of information and of even of action that springs from an intuition that's clear of course i can have intuitions which are not clear uh or which are uh in some way misattuned or unattuned or attuned to something that is out of tune with something else. And I discovered that actually through the process of action. And feels good through the body, synchronizing chakras and free flow and clear springs from clear. Hmm. And then what happens to feels good? It eventually dissipates and becomes occluded with the smog of deficient mentality. <laughs> <laughs> it's back to you know, industrial strength window washer uh, treatment. And, and when it dissipates into mental deficient window fog, what would you like to have happen? <laughs> I would like for uh, the, the fog to clear and for clarity to return. And fog, for... fog to clear mm -hmm. and clarity to return. Mm -hmm. And can that happen? It doesn't seem to be completely subject to my will. Uh, <laughs> that, that I can tell you, right? But it's not impervious to my desire or to my disciplined uh, efforts, I believe. And it's not subject to your will, but it's not impervious. And fog to clear and clarity and springs from clear and free flow. Hmm. And when free flow and sync, synchronized chakras. Is there anything else about free flow? There's something to do with language. 
right. and a fluency in, with language. A feeling state with language. Of a fluency. Oh, oh fluency. excuse me. With language. In other words, that I don't have to think so much about what I'm saying. What I'm saying is coming from a sense of clarity, a feeling of clarity, a free flow of thought through my body, mind, voice, vocal apparatus. Or... And, and the free flow through body, mind, and voice. And then what happens to an elegant combination? It degrades over, over time <laughs> and becomes a, a, a tangled uh, heap. And that it itself has value. It's not without value uh, because combinations can become, be recombined. They can provide raw material for new combinations and so there's a churning process i would say to these a, combinations a churning process mm -hmm. and is there anything else about churning it reminds me of yogurt and kefir and the lumpiness of those substances yogurt so. kefir and lumpiness mm -hmm. <coughs> From a fermentation process, but my, my wife Kayla makes yogurt and kefir. She's been keeping the cultures going. And is that a good place to pause? I think so. Okay. And could you make a map of <laughs> tuition? Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense to you? Yeah, a very probiotic map. <laughs> <laughs> and and while he's doing his map, could we go to you, Doug? Could you share your map with us? Yes. Very uh, rudimentary. Uh, there you go. Uh huh. Well, okay. It, that says so. I gave it a title: a blind attention. Uh, there's a, a distant voice or a knowing in the language, and then there's the the swoop <laughs> to that that point. Um, and then it's kind of vocalized um, in my head as like an ah, kind of a, almost a relaxing sensation, or it can be an aha moment, and it, I can be expressed with another or in, expressed within. It can, it can be expressed with another or expressed within and vocalized in your head and swoop. That about covers it. <laughs> and with all of that, what are you most drawn to in your map? I like my new word, swoop. Uh, that's pretty nice. Uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Kung Fu Panda, but the skadoosh that he does there at the end. Um, I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> um, but you can, that, I guess he gets this all encompassing power to kind of skadoosh all that's around him and skadoosh. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's it. Maybe somebody else can say something. Like that. Um, yeah, that's what it makes me think of. Cool. Thank you. And Ed. Yes. Can you share your map? I can. Okay. You're ready for it. Ah. All right. Try to get this in here. I see a smile. Okay. There's a, there's a stick figure with a smile in the minor, middle, and he's in a dotted uh, rhombus, if you will, or diamond. Uh -huh. And on one side, there's an eye, and on the other side, there's a horn. That's the sound or the eye, and there's a heart for the feeling. And that's all encompassed within a larger framework that's also – the head of a stick figure. Uh -huh. so sometimes it's inside and sometimes it's outside, as I was saying. Um, so sometimes I'm in the situation, sometimes the situation is outside of me. And the, you know, the, the intuitions are sometimes 
audio and there are sometimes, you know, I, I hear things or I'll, I'll, a lot of times I hear words. Um, there, I have a little voice that speaks to me when, when needs be. Uh, and sometimes I, I see it. It takes on a particular um, visual shape that is not necessarily there, if you will. Well, it's kind of like in, in the movies when they show you that the, that the good guy changes into a bad guy kind of thing and you see his evil face at one time, but that kind of thing. Um, but uh, in the, the feeling part, the heart, um, is where I get a I get a feel for 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 what's happening in the in the situation. And when you get a feel mm-hmm. in the heart for the situation, what happens to a little voice? Um, when I'm having the feeling, I don't hear the voice, and I don't see. I think it's like it's one one kind of sense or the other. I, I either I, I see something. And that's the intuition, or I hear some of the voice that's an intuition, or I feel something, and that's the intuition. And then I, then I kind of know, you know, it's, I'm either being told, or I see, or I, I, I feel that capital K knowing that th- this is how, how things are at this point. And what are you most drawn to in your map? I think the fact that I'm inside and outside at the same time. Wow. Inside and outside at yeah. the same time. Yeah, yeah that, that, that was kind of like the afterthought. I put a little on the smiley face. I put some ears and then I made the, the, the larger stick figure because that was that the last question that you'd come to. And it, you know, sometimes I feel within it and sometimes it's like I'm a, an observer of it. Sometimes in it, sometimes yeah. an observer of it. That's it. That's what, it. what determines observer of it or in it? Well, that I don't know. I, th- I think that's situation dependent. Situation dependent. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If I were to speculate, I'd say it's it's how how involved I feel in in the situation. And sometimes I get an intuition when I going down the street and you see some people doing things and you go, mm, I kind of know what's happening there kind of thing. And other times it's maybe it's here at home, you know, with the grandson and, and I'm more involved in that mm-hmm. than detached from it or separate from it. Maybe that has something to do with it. I don't, I never, I never really thought about it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And Marco. Yes. Have you finished your map? Can you show us? <clears throat> He's still firm in it's, it's a work in progress, of course. Um, they all, I don't know if you can see this. Oh, man. Uh-huh. And he always has these things. It's nonlinear. Nonlinear? <laughs> um. So let me try to relate this, I guess, to what I was saying earlier. And I was also peripherally picking up on Ed and Doug. So they may have surreptitiously infected my map. <laughs> um, but uh, like the stick figure there, I think. Yeah, that's the unclear <laughs> parts of mine. Yeah. <laughs> I was also beginning to think of this. The, what what did you call it? The swoop, the swoop, swoop, the swoop, the swoosh, the swoosh. Yeah, the swoosh began sort of crept in over here as well. This started out as a kind of curd, a hit a hill of curd, mm-hmm. uh, and you can see a landscape and a constellation of stars. Mm-hmm. This is that combination. Uh, quality that there's a meaning in the combination of these entities um, I grounded this in a Colorado sort of landscape so you could see these mountains here those are the Twin Peaks so-called Twin Peaks uh, visible from the town where I live Longmont not the same Twin Peaks as the David Lynch series <laughs> 
Uh, there are some UFOs as well in the picture. And I'm hopeful that I'll be able to communicate with them soon. They've landed, as you can see yeah. over here. <laughs> There's uh, someone exiting the vehicle and I'm, this is kind of me. I'm stand, my hair is on my, standing up. That's how astonished I am. <laughs> by, what's go, by the scene. And um, this is an underground root system, maybe earthworms creating tunnels underground. Uh, some either rhizomatic or uh, biodynamic type of system. And then there are various flows around space, a kind of swooshing. Uh, there's a a heart shape here, I was also seeing this constellation as sort of an externalized heart mm -hmm. and held in that space so that when it comes together, it opens that, that gate. Uh, it become, the heart becomes not a closed container, but an, but an open uh, theater of, um, of significance. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy with this. I didn't... Um, I had no idea I was <laughs> what I was going to say. <laughs> and you're, and you're no happy? Idea. Yes, I am. And what are you most drawn to in your map? I, I, uh, it's good. There's some squiggly lines here, the very top. I'm not sure what those are. Uh -huh. I don't know what, where they even came from. I don't even remember drawing them. So I'm uh -huh. curious about those. And you don't remember drawing them? No. Uh, this is a research question. What are you drawn, most drawn to in other people's maps? Can I see them again? Could you hold up your maps, guys? I, I just want to make a quick comment that um, the... The heart for me, I'm trying to imagine it right now, just as I accumulate, or we all kind of accumulated each other's maps um, this time and previously. Uh, my heart still, still within my body. It's not within my space where the heart is. It's it's up here in my head. I, uh -huh. I can imagine. Um, so maybe that's the mind attempting to process this this heart <coughs> intuition, or maybe I I just don't have a heart. <laughs> well, the first thing I was drawn to is the hearts in Ed's, in Ed's. And then as soon as I looked over to, to Doug's uh, picture, that shape at the bottom looked like a heart to me, even though it's not the you know, traditional sim symbolic form of a heart. It seemed like a heart sort of ish shape. And then the uh, spheres kind of coming, coming out of it. So you, maybe you do have a heart. Oh, you gotta have heart. <laughs> All you really need is heart. Okay, I'll break out in the song if there's time later. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I do with my dementia clients. When in doubt, I start singing Broadway songs, and then they get really happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a beautiful morning. It's so helpful to have the music is something that goes very deep. Mm -hmm. and they may lost everything, but they... You know, the elders in their 90s, they know Broadway and Cole Porter. And so uh, that's another alternate way of knowing that I have used to create very high degrees of rapport with people who are supposed to not be, you know, functioning at all. So I'm really enjoying this process. I really thank you guys for making this effort. Um, if Is there anyone else who wants to make a comment on someone else's map? Because I'm... I'm very interested in how, once you make your map, you're then in a position to compare and contrast and to um, see what may emerge. So, I'm sorry, did you have something, Doug? I, I just wanted to go off the, the kind of breaking out into song and, and kind of the acting mentality in general. Um, this, this past year that I've had my revelation or whatever last year of attempting deeper, more meaningful, more spiritual communication. Um, I found myself, which it's mostly personal at this point, I can do it with my family, um, 
don't have any friends right now. And maybe you guys here in a minute, like I said, but I, I'm singing more often. I'm, I sing in the car constantly. I, I have these grand ideas that maybe within two or three years, I'll be able to be at a coffee shop and sense some sort of, uh, there's not very good air here. So let me just change, change people's mentality with a nice little rendition of some song I made up in my head or some theatrical moment. I have no experience with acting or any of that. Um, and it's very, very powerful, very enlightening in a sense. Um, I feel like that's my forced enlightenment that I wish upon people. I don't want these cranial devices that, I mean, that's just something that's there, but forced enlightenment in my mind is that ability to these two, this couple's <laughs> fighting at a table over here and maybe I'll become the opera singer that you see at Italian restaurants and kind of stop everybody in the moment and say, this is what you need. <laughs> but I'm hoping to reach that point in 15, 20 years. That's wonderful. Anything else? Someone, any uh, learn? Don't poop on anybody's head uh, when you sing. <laughs> I'm sorry, what, what was that? I, I, I advise Doug not to poop on anybody's head when he breaks out into song. <laughs> I, I do have a, a bird poop story, and maybe that's uh, what got me out of the mode of intuition, but um, no, I'll say that for another time. <laughs> um, just a something that I could share. I had a, I think, I think Doug, you and I we were, you were doing some uh, online. You, you were, I, I could pick up some stuff from your metaphors and it really, uh, I could tell, Oh, this, this guy really goes into his metaphorical landscape really fast. That was cool. And uh, this was even, I think, I don't know if we had any interaction on, uh, in this form yet, but I remember saying something about the mother star and I said, when I get better at the mother star, at, tr at channeling the mother star, I'll get back to you. And I was being very playful. But then I had, last night, I had a dream. And this very powerful woman, much larger than myself, wrapped me in her arms. And she sang this song, which I'm, when you wish upon a star, makes no difference who you are. When you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. And I started to sing it too. <laughs> but, I, but in my dream body, I have a much more beautiful voice. <laughs> I was able to hit these really high notes and go down. To, and, um, and then it was only when I woke up and jotted the dream down that I started to realize, oh, yeah. I feel like there's a connection here, you know, that the, maybe I am starting to channel the mother star. <laughs> but I think it's just wonderful how uh, these kind of cross fertilizations, um, I think can enrich our maps. And I believe uh, create a much deeper sense of what these abstract concepts like intuition could possibly mean. Um, because I think we have to constantly update our epistemology and our ontology and our phenomenology i think it all works together so i've learned a lot today and i've really enjoyed this opportunity to to share at the edge of my map <laughs> and uh i'm really curious what happens next and if you guys have any comments to make about this process or or about the article that i wrote or anything you're thinking about any projects you have i'd be really open to you know I guess we, 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 we had 10 more minutes, right, Marco? Well, you know, technically, we have yeah. <laughs> all the time in the world. But yeah. I, just uh, wanted to, I just wanted to respect everyone's time frame. So. Mm -hmm. I, I do have a lot to do because I'm going to be traveling very soon. So I, let's wrap it up mm -hmm. in 10 minutes or so. If some alien inspiration overtakes us, you know, I won't stop it. But um, I – so go um, well, what would you like to do with the last 10 minutes? It, I'm, it's an open frame. Mm -hmm. Wherever you want to go with this maps of time. I was thinking about um, having done the maps of intuition and the maps of time. Um, is there a relationship between the maps of time and the maps of intuition? 
or is the relationship between any of these maps and um, Carrie Welch and um, Eric Weiss and who is the other, the, oh, and Gebser. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about uh, that higher octave that Gebser was predicting um, as we start to e efficient, archaic, efficient, magic, efficient, um, uh, mental, um, what happens next? I, and I, I'm just trusting that these kinds of processes using clean language, symbolic modeling is the method that I use. And of course there's med meditation and art and dance and literature, all many ways for us to explore. But I think this is just a, a very useful tool for working with groups and um, for maybe um, uh, opening up possibilities, hmm. chase the possibilities in one another's experience. Anyway, hmm. that's my hope and that, that we can reconnect this to the, the meta theories that we're exploring. Because I mm. think it's very important that we you know, get a real clear sense of this. Because mm. I was reading the Gebser when I had that experience with the bird. Mm. Uh, it was a, a very shortly after that. I think I'd read the Feuerstein's book, but I hadn't read Gebser. I'd read Wilbur. And, um, and I, I found Gebser in a, in a bookstore. And I started to read it and I felt, oh my God, this guy, this, this helps. Mm -hmm. so, Ray helped me and I read it and I didn't quite, and I didn't get it. It was way over my head, but I got, I got a feeling that uh, Gebser knew this territory. And, um, and now decades later, here we are, you know, with a, a much more expanded vocabulary that we can share and draw upon than I certainly had back then. Well, I can tell you, John, as much as I hate to draw things because I'm so bad at it, I do find it helpful to try to put down on paper in some kind of shape or form what it is that I think I just said. Uh, that, that part is, is, is very helpful. And the, and the thing that struck me about, about my, my map today as opposed to the, or in comparison to the map the last time, is is how disconnected it all is, you know, for me, this is just, you know, cause I, I have these pieces and they all just, they're just kind of there. It's, it's like, it's like I have a puzzle on the table and all the pieces are out there, but I don't know what the picture is that I'm supposed to be putting together. I'm not a, I'm not a big puzzle person. You know, I have a daughter and a son-in-law, they like to do that. And I'll sit down with them for hours simply because I find it very nice to concentrate on something and not think about anything else for a while. So I do that, but I'm not, I'm not really good at those kinds of things. And, and, and it, it's, it strikes me that, that you have to, you have to try to find some way to make those squigglies relate to whatever it is you're going to say later, you know, um, and, and that, that's also uh, very much of a challenge because, uh, to me, a lot of these things are just there. You know, I'm, you know, you, you had mentioned right at the beginning about the bird and, the, you know, and it's like, well, so why did the bird land on you? Obviously, you had, you had made contact with, with the bird or it wouldn't have been there. <laughs> For me, it, to me, that was just, okay, well. Well, there it is, and 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 I'm really glad you know you found you found that bridge, the St. Francis of Assisi bridge, which can very be very helpful. I have also found um, in dealing with animals, uh, whenever you encounter them, whether it's a dog that's about to, you know, this barking tremendous. A lot of times, I'll go walking with the grandson, and there's a lot of people who have dogs because we're kind of rural, and they'll come out and all start barking and barking and barking, and I usually my first impression is I just think of St. Francis and then most of them calm down and then they bark and then you realize I'm, I'm just, I'm just saying hello kind of thing. It's not like, Oh, I'm being aggressive or I'm being a dog. And I also sense, and this is one of those intuition things where I can feel it more than see it, that my, my grandson tunes into that too, because his first question is always, you know, does that dog bite? You know? And and, and he doesn't know, and I don't know, and maybe they do, and maybe they don't, but I generally, we have one biter here in the neighborhood, and we all kind of know that, but the other ones are kind of like uncharted territory, 
And I also I often wonder sometimes, well, how much of this is he picking up? Because I've noticed that he picks up everything. You know, as a child, as a two and a half, three year old, he's like a sponge. He picks up all of the nonverbal signals that we communicate. He picks up all of the tones. He picks up all of the the intuition. It's it's just it's a, absolutely fascinating to see. You know what what I have lost. You know, in my sixty eight years of you know running around this planet, they, they kind of get speed out of you, you know, along the line because he's still very very sensitive to all those kinds of things and, 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 and very receptive to what, to what they have to offer. And so I've been trying to use them a lot lately as kind of a, a mentor to sort it out with this intuitive stuff again, you know. So. Thank um, you for sharing that, Ed. I mean, I'm, for me, I'm wondering um, how much of it have we lost? Mm-hmm. How much of it could be regained? Well, I think it's buried we more than we lost. Cleans, cleans the the lens yeah. of our perception. I think wasn't that if we read enough poetry, I think the poets are. What I think that's William Blake cleansing yeah. the lens of perception. We would see infinity everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering, and you know, I'm just wondering. Um, for me, it's been um, a struggle, but also a triumph in some ways. I mean, I had breakthroughs that, like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> But they've always humbled me profoundly because I didn't feel like I'm I've, I've in control or can operationalize all of this. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's an important point, John. You have them, you go, ah, well, well, gee, it wasn't yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, and you have to chop wood and carry water afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Things don't change at all. And actually it gives you a, an added uh, sense of pressure mm-hmm. because you have this cognitive dissonance, this this uh, mental deficient fog that starts to settle back in really fast. Mm-hmm. And so that's why it is a discipline, I think, to enjoy those flow states. And then to, it's a discipline to cultivate them, create conditions. You can't cause them. No. no. Make them happen. But you can create conditions. That's why I believe we have prepared minds here. We're mm-hmm. preparing our minds for this group transmission. I believe we're transmitting energies to one another mm-hmm. on a conscious level. And then <laughs> level. we're picking up on things. Um, and I think that's the transparency that's being promised, I think, by, uh, by uh, Gebser. And if we can, um, of course, there are things we hide from people and we don't want them to know. But I think that's going to be, that's becoming increasingly more difficult because of our technology. Right. But also, if we all, if people cared about each other, it wouldn't be frightening to be transparent. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. there's some bad actors out there who take advantage of it that we, I think, shut down uh, and we become very thick and we uh, eliminate a lot of our experience that could be useful to us. Mm-hmm. So this is, I guess, part of my mission here is to uh, you know, start to, to be as transparent as possible and to allow that transmission to occur and be influenced. I mean, we're here to influence one another. There's, and I think that's so, it's a real delicate balance. Um, so anyway, that's, thank you very much for mm-hmm. sharing with that. I'd like to share something, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't know exactly <clears throat> the full shape of it, but it, it relates to, Ed, you're sharing about your grandson, and mm-hmm. Doug also, your ta- um, uh, sharing of, the aspiration to sing and how singing is something that you are just doing spontaneously more. Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I do the same thing. And mm-hmm. act, and it, it's something that emerged for me when I became a dad. Mm-hmm. And, and because of, you know, because my daughters didn't understand uh, my philosophy. <laughs> they didn't understand my medicine. Really? <laughs> you know, I couldn't use it. <laughs> you know, it didn't didn't calm the, the you know the hysterical outburst. The, the, it didn't work. So that's how I began learning, and then I realized I liked it, and I realized that I was becoming sensitive in a way, and partly through the music, and partly. Um, 
you know, uh, because I became sensitive, I was able to sing. Like, a song could come through me. Uh, mm-hmm. And there, there is something so, I think, important about the, the connection with uh, children and also old, uh, the elderly. Old, you know, the, those uh, kind you of that's old people. Chaos. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well... I'm I'm referring to John, you know John's uh, work as a caregiver. Uh, yeah. Um, but really, it's the full spectrum because you know as we go through life, we pass through different phases and different you know sets of kinds of relationships and ways that we relate to our own mortality and ways that we relate to to others and relationships and friendships and etc. And so there's some again I'm going to use the word that. It's it's a lazy word, I think, but information that is uh, contained or transmitted in each of those phases, and the mental just is, is monophasic. You've said this, John, you, uh, before, and it doesn't communicate w- with the others uh, yep. because, uh, well, be- it believes in its own. Uh, ontology and epistemology it, 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 it doesn't have the um, flexibility or the fluency to move between phases and to sing when appropriate and theorize when appropriate and even you know sometimes sing as a as a theory as theory and theorize as singing there, there's ways that these can blend and uh, I I I, I had an interesting blending uh, the other day, prompted, influenced uh, by your question to me about the void. I wanted to think about it and respond thoughtfully and feel into it. I, I had some ideas. I have a lot of ideas about the void and the nothing and all these, you know, theories of um, app of what's not present. But uh, I didn't want to speak out of that because it would just have been just more mentalizing. So I sat with uh, the, the question. I read through the, the threads on the forum. And I um, just spent some time really stilling and sort of circling into more of a still point. Uh, and then I went inside to my house. It was probably around dinner time or so. And uh, my wife, Kayla, wanted to go out and do some Christmas uh, shopping and asked if she could leave the girls with me or we had planned it. I don't remember, but I stayed home. And so I sat on the couch and was going to continue composing my reply to to the message. And uh, so I put on, I decided to put on some music. And the way that my room is set up there's a, a tv and speakers and the receiver and the couch is opposite so it's a comfortable place to sit and i have my mobile device and i was uh, just going to sit there and the girls were doing their thing but when i put on the music they came in and they started interacting and wanting to play and uh you know from to my mental mind distracting me <laughs> from what i had set out to do which was write this this uh response to the the forum but uh i I um, had I had also been just around that time reading um, Stephen Hawking's piece about black holes and what happens at the event horizon of the black hole and how the information could theoretically be preserved in a holographic form on that event horizon and then radiated out as this this kind of emission from the black hole and so there, therefore not being truly lost and yet Hawking's as you know, believes that that information, yes, gets preserved, but then it's completely useless. So I thought that was funny. Um, and, uh, and it was on just what I was thinking about in that moment. And also kind of putting myself in the experience. Like if I was going into a black hole, what would that be like? <laughs> and then, so I, I sat down, I put on some music. And the first music I put on was this uh, experimental drone music which came on a CD that was included in the uh, edition of that book that I posted the metapsychosis review of uh, sustained decay on uh, drone music and mysticism. So I put that in 
And it was, it started out, the first track was not a, a deep, spacious, sort of low, it was a, a loud electronic, like frenzy of noise. And my daughter said, no, no, that's terrible. Turn it off. We kind of, you know, kind of drove everybody a little bit crazy. So I flipped through my library and I, and I came upon um, a piece of classical music. My older daughter, particularly, she hates pop music. If I put on any kind of pop, she hates jazz too. If I put any, anything but classical, she, she gets very annoyed. Uh, and so I put on a piece by Messiaen. I don't know his first name, the composer Messiaen, called Quartets for the End of Time. I put it on, and uh, it's this, uh, I would Olivia. say very, yeah, sort of polytonal, uh, um, organically structured music, I, I would say. And also dark uh, and in inquiring and has various qualities to it. As I put it on, as it started playing and the mood took hold in, in, in the living room, I was about to copy a quote from the article by Stephen Hawking and paste it into my editor where I was composing the reply to the forum when my daughter ex suddenly exclaimed, Daddy, no, this makes me feel like I'm falling into a black hole. Mm. <laughs> you know, I think that's Olivier. We get it. Olivier, yes, yes. I think that's it was right. composed in a concentration camp. The yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so that's all. I, I, I know I saw immediately what the meaning was <laughs> of that <laughs> moment. Uh, and uh, it was delightful to me that it all came together that way. And it gave me, I think, some insight, which would be hard, would be hard to mentally kind of parse other than to tell the story. Mm hmm and maybe, maybe it becomes a poem or maybe it becomes a song or, or something like that, but I wouldn't know how to explain that. Uh, you know, there's like the you know, rational actor theory maybe, or kind of like Doug, what you talk, said, like sh naturally she might pick up on that. Um, but the, the fact that it's natural is part of what's so extraordinary. Yeah. Can I, can I? Yeah, I, well, I think there's a, a psychic transmission going on between children and parents for sure. <coughs> yeah, parents don't always get it. Yeah. <laughs> can, can I yeah. respond to? Sorry, if I'm cutting you off, John, you can continue. No, 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 go, go I, ahead. Um, I, my void, um, uh, my void focus, I suppose. Um, over, I think it was over the weekend when. When Marco had this this time, I I was about to actually post something right after I noticed he did because earlier that day I had this this void reflection and I I didn't know where it came from and once I reflected and looked back on the post I I saw it I think it started with your Hamlet um, to be or not to be um, post there and it it was subconscious and I, at that Friday maybe when you posted I didn't think two cents about it and I woke up and or it was early in the morning my my son had Thomas the Train audio recordings on uh, on my computer and then it went from those audio recordings into an artist uh, death blues is what they're called and the whole reason uh, I think John Mueller is his name the whole reason he started death blues was because of a story he read about a child that uh, his parents were having an argument and a police officer comes and just kind of sits and eats with him for a little bit and really has a profound effect on this boy. Um, tells him a story, um, kind of <coughs> asks him what's, what he wants to do with his life and all that type of stuff. And then the police officer goes and then I don't know if within the story he, he dies or gets shot in the line of duty right then or later on that day and that boy kind of grew up and his life was affected by that moment. Um, but John Mueller, the artist, kind of reflects on this in the Death Blues um, artistry that he does as um, kind of seeing death as that chance to reflect. And I, I, I hope I can remember to post the, the website, but it's pretty intense uh, music and um, production that he did on the website there. Um, 
but all this kind of came together. And when I went, I, w- I was on my way to the shower, so I didn't have a chance to turn it off because I knew myself, just like Marco was saying, he's definitely, he's a classical music type of fella. And it's not like pop or any other things. Um, so when I went to the shower, uh, I, I started having these epiphanies of, of what I'm talking about, the death blues is all about. And I didn't realize this until I reflected upon it and then realized the Hamlet and all this. And it was very, very interesting. And I think we all, I don't know if Ed, Ed wanted to dive into the void there with us, but uh, the three of us here were kind of focused on that mentality. And it's really interesting how we all kind of group together. Even, even you were talking about the touch. Uh, mm. And I was thinking at that same time, you talked about it, the long distance, but, Mm. We might shake hands eventually. It sounds mm-hmm. like you and Marco have met John, but um, mm-hmm. we have that, that yeah. long distance that we have uh, is shared through the vicarious kind of interactions we have going on here. Um, yeah. I, I I wanted to respond. To, um, I think it was you, Doug. You may mention you posted something about uh, Carl Jung, and I think you posed a question about did I know of any updates to Carl Jung. Um, and his a, a causal connecting principle, his theory, I think he worked it out with Pauli, the, the physicist, they co-authored something. I haven't read it yet. But I was, uh, I, I think in one call, I, I pointed that out and I said, I would like us to update the synchronicity, hmm. uh, serendipity. Um, that I, I don't think the a causal connecting principle that Jung came up with is sufficient. And I think Eric Weiss, in that essay we all read together, he was pointing out uh, that, uh, you know, how hard it is for the the mental to deal with synchronicity and the magical and all that. So I'm, and I'm, then I'm picking up on um, that possibility that we could update Carl Jung. Uh, and also from the kind of experiments we've been conducting and looking at um, the, the, the monophasic and the polyphasic. Um, I know that Kerry Welch is studying, you know, mapping on from Gebser to EEG and the brain waves. Um, and I and I believe that the exercises that we've been conducting are getting the benefits of trance. We're I think doing trance work here, but it's a trance without coma. <laughs> you know? We're not going into into the void. Although the void can be, we can have a relationship to the void and um, we can see here, smell, taste, touch, and we can put it into words and we can map it. And, and like you said, Ed, there's something that happens when you make that attempt to map. And once you got the map and you've externalized, then you can re-internalize something that was internal and hidden now becomes external and shared. And then it returns back into your neurology. So I think that, is uh, the best of all possible worlds when we start working that way. And um, that's why I'm encouraged that uh, the apperspectival or the integral is, uh, it, those are performances that I believe we, 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 we can tap into these, you know, the powers of our mind body and we can share. I think we're all going to be enjoying our lives much more and letting these aesthetic relationships start to uh, recoalesce in, in probably unpredictable ways. But I think having a project like uh, updating Jung has been on the, my back burner for a very long time. And so I think when I review this and uh, watch the video and maybe you guys can share with me, whatever comes up for you um, between now and first of the year, when we get back together again, um, maybe we'll, some kind of project will, will uh, want to be concressed through this process because uh, now I feel like I can go back and read a lot of material that just overwhelmed me um, because, you know, these eruptions um, can be very destabilizing. It may take a while for them to, to be integrated and become, uh, become a, a part of a coherent attractor because this uh, experience that I shared in this paper that's like how they're almost 30 years ago. That very much threw me for a loop. I was freaked out for years after that. <clears throat> and I shut down on stuff. 
no more of the psychic shit. I'm not teaching Reiki anymore. <laughs> I just, I was too open and it, it got very, uh, uh, I didn't want to be taking on all these pathologies. Uh, I just didn't have the mental maturity or the interest. It, uh, so now I'm starting to realize that that deficient mental phase that I was dominated by, um, I had to, uh, you know, do some deeper study and, I've been doing it on my own, almost entirely alone. And now I feel like in the last couple of years, I'm able to articulate this with a group uh, like we're doing now. And so I believe we're really using this technology. Uh, we're creating a new internet because I think these are very good uses for, you know, putting our talents together to do something like this. Um, can, I, so, can I read a quote from a wise man named uh, John Davis? <laughs> in, in your paper, you say, I'm convinced that community is a necessary condition for this integration to happen. So, there you go. You've said That's it before. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And tuning and, uh, into the ineffable and taking form and transforming and living, for, being formless and then re, re, re entering form. There's a, there's a model here in this paper already. They're, they're, their structures that I could see being put into practice. Uh, so it's good. And so I think we are doing one. it. Yeah, I think we're doing, I think we are doing it. And um, <coughs> I, I, uh, I want to share a couple of things more on the sort of logistical side. I'm intending to create a post in the cafe where we list out the sessions we've had and maybe upcoming sessions as placeholders as a wiki so that we could begin to sort of chart out okay. uh, subjects for future meetings. Uh, and we could all see it and work on it. So see, Ed, if you, mm -hmm. you offered to lead a, a, a talk on the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, yeah. on, uh, so that would be something we could slot in somewhere. Uh, <laughs> Also, I think it would be uh, it would it would add to the creativity of the group if we bring in individuals who we you know as guests to present on something that they're working on uh, and allow it allow the meta mind to uh, to chew on that <laughs> for uh, and uh, and work with it. Uh, I have a couple of people in mind. You all may have people in mind and. Can we bring them into the conversation, kind of flow them, you know, flow them through? Uh, maybe they stay and, for, and, maybe, they, and yeah, maybe they keep going, but there's some kind of uh, information flow that we create uh, with perspectives. And we could look at that over the, you know, over a time period. So it doesn't have to be next week necessarily. It could be a couple of weeks from now, a few months from now, whatever it is, sort of feeling the, 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 the landscape or the, the, uh, just the shape of, of emergent time. I don't know. Like, that's what we're doing is modeling how to do it. But that would be a simple way of creating some linear predictability to, uh, to what we're doing because I do like to prepare for, for these. And so it's good to be able to read ahead of time. I have some, I've got uh, Love, Power, and Justice, for example. I have Listening Society. Uh, I, ha I ha don't yet have the Cosmic hologram but I, I have uh, the holographic universe which mm -hmm. is uh, maybe an early, I guess an earlier um, uh, take on that yes. those yep. ideas yep. so it takes time though to, to prepare and I'd like to have a sense of of a, a you know a program if you will uh, even though it, be it open-ended as it, as it as I think it needs mm -hmm. to be so that's all I'm gonna I'm gonna post that there and Good. invite you to work you know, to if, if you guys could post your drawings, that would be great too. I'd appreciate mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that's and I think self understood. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Regardless of how embarrassing it is that I can't draw, I'll I'll post it. <laughs> that's the uh, yeah. I am. My wife is a uh, she's a you know she's an illustrator, draw an artist, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I draw because of my kids. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones who got, who got me to loosen up around, around yeah. drawing. 
Yeah, okay. And they, they are just endless. They, they, there's no critic. There's no filter. It just, it yeah. just pours forth. And it's, <laughs> um, I, that is buried. Uh, for, mm-hmm. for, for, but it could be unearthed. And then, then you get, it's surprising what, what you find. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why they call it mining. You never know when you're going to get a <laughs> come across a gem. You can oh. always try adding some color. <laughs> it's like a fuzzy noise, Doug. So I don't know. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, uh, we'll re- reconvene in, in January. Um, happy holidays happy new year and and john i hope we can get together uh i'll i'll hopefully get to be in touch about that today Mm -hmm. i'm looking forward to it okay good and it'll be next week you you said we're yeah i'll I'll be uh we're leaving on friday we should be there all next week and then i think through the weekend right looking forward to it okay wonderful thank you all right. It was fun. Don't forget right. to see it. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Take care.